Work on that one. Uh, next month, next month is Kids Month, uh, so we'll work on that during Kids Month. Uh, and since we're talking about that every year, we, we've been doing Kids Month. This is going to be the third year we're doing Kids Month. And during Kids Month, we do something different during uh, worship in terms of the sermon series. And so I'm just giving you a heads up. If you uh, prefer not to mix some movies with sermons, uh, that's probably not your month to come to church. Um, wish you would be here and enjoy it. Uh, just giving you a heads up. It's a little bit different. And we also have fun activities throughout the months for kids uh, during and after church, as well as VBS happening in the middle of the month. So if you want any more information on any of that, please visit our website, lifepointcfc.org. A couple of weeks ago, we started a brand new series titled The Warrior, and we're uh, looking at what it means to be a man in 2023. And so we've, we've been talking about how we bridge the gap from where we are today and where God wants us to be. And last week, we started a, a story in the book of Joshua. It's actually a story of Joshua. Uh, fun fact, we don't know who wrote the book of Joshua. It might have been Joshua himself or some other people helping him out. Uh, but we do know is that the story contains kind of the gap between Moses leading the people of God from Egypt, from being slaves 430 years to being in the wilderness and having to wander because they kind of messed up. They forgot to trust God and they had to wander for 40 years. And so uh, the book of Joshua is about God's people finally making it into the promised land. And last week, we kind of stepped into the story of Joshua. Moses has died. He finds out Moses is not coming back. He's all alone in terms of leadership, direction, purpose, in terms of counsel, in terms of having a friend, someone have his back. And he kind of feels alone and he feels discouraged and he feels a little bit scared and a little bit afraid. He doesn't know how to navigate. And so we looked at that first chapter in Joshua, Joshua 1, where God reminds him three times to be brave and to be courageous and one time he says don't be anxious don't be scared for I will be with you and so we learned that to be a warrior in 2023 doesn't mean that we're not scared it doesn't mean that we know it all it doesn't mean that we have it all figured out shoot it doesn't even mean that we know how to do everything even though sometimes we want to pretend we do or that we're not lost when we really are lost. A warrior means that I am willing to trust God even when I don't know what's gonna happen. And so uh, we're looking at this definition of warrior um, that I found on the internet, and the internet only has true things and good things. Um, and it says here, a warrior shows great courage and perseverance, uh, one with the willpower to overcome any struggle. And so just a reminder is that we will have struggles. It's not, um, uh, it's not matter, a matter of yes or no, but when. We all have struggles. You might be in a struggle right now. You might have been in a struggle for a while. You just may be overcoming a struggle. But how we overcome those struggles is what makes us a warrior. Today we're talking about a little bit about how God moves. Um, and I don't believe it's a question if God moves, but more of a fact, God moves. And God decides to move when he chooses and how he chooses. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. And so Joshua was on the brink of seeing God move, but he needed to anticipate it and prepare for it. Um, I love space, and a couple of years ago we signed up for the IMAX theater out in St. Augustine. They had a membership for a whole year to take our kids, and they had a bunch of documentaries that our kids could watch. And so a lot of those had to do with space, and just fascinating how NASA has evolved uh, throughout the years, and the specific things they're able to do in space with astronauts wearing these crazy heavy suits, and they're having to uh, deal with tools that are hard to even handle without that giant glove in your hand and having to do it such such a precise manner and if you mess up you could die so yeah those types of situations and and so I'd spent some time reading about you know the first time that we went out to outer space and what that felt like but more importantly the preparation that went into to making that happen, to making this picture happen, right? That's a beautiful picture of Earth. I think it's one of the first pictures taken uh, from Mars of planet Earth. And then uh, we have this guy here who was the first one uh, to make it, uh, have a spacewalk from the US, Ed White. Um, and he was able to do this, or all of them were able to do this from Freedom 7 to Gemini 4 because a lot of preparation took place. In the early stages in the 1960s to prepare an astronaut to go to space, it wasn't just like you need to learn how to wear a spacesuit in space. No, it was like a bunch of like eight to ten different categories that you need to be prepared for from mental abilities, physical abilities, from being in, in 
uh, in, in zero gravity uh, from going from G-Force 1 to G-Force probably 5 or 6. And a lot of science was behind this, a lot of preparation, but very interesting. A lot of it was guesswork, like the first trips to space was just to figure out what space was like and if the spaceship could handle space and if the spacesuit could handle the pressure. And so it was a lot of guesswork, right? So imagine being in that astronaut suit and them telling you, well, we don't know if this is going to work out, but you'll let us know. <laughs> you'll let us know. And so the first trips to space were for a couple of minutes. They made it out into outer space and then made it back home and, and they kept doing this over and over again. And the more they did it, the better prepared they came. And so one of the simulators that they did was pretty interesting. Um, they call it kind of the vomit simulator because they would put you in a plane uh, with a bunch of cushioning and they would have the plane go straight up into the sky and then once they reached a certain altitude, the plane would just tip down and just go straight down. And the purpose of doing this was to create zero gravity just for a couple of seconds. And in those couple of seconds of zero gravity, it was enough for you to throw up in your own suit um, and to experience space just for a couple of seconds, which I, I imagine was fascinating. Um, but that was part of it, right? It's part of it. One of the things that really caught my attention was that one of the key things for an astronaut to really, really be ready for space was mission familiarization. In other words, they needed to know the mission inside out, upside down. They needed to be repeated in their sleep. They needed to know every single uh, detail of their spacesuit, of the spaceship, of the mission, the trajectory, time, space, speed. It all needed to be in their mind because if something happened out there and they lost communication with Houston, they needed to be able to figure it out on their own. And not only that, but there was always a delay in communication from the spaceship to Houston. Sometimes it was a couple of seconds, sometimes it was a couple of minutes, and sometimes the message never made it. So imagine having to go to space and prepare for space. You don't know if everything's going to work out. You don't know if the spacesuit's going to hold, the spaceship's going to hold. You don't know if you're going to make it back. As a matter of fact, you don't know if you're going to make it past you know, the, the, the barrier speed or the outer layer of Earth. You don't know what anything's going to look like or what's going to feel like, but you're probably excited that you're in that ship and it's going to happen. And so from anywhere from six months to three years of training, you're putting it all into this one moment, hoping that it all works out. I think many times we're not going out of space or wearing space spacesuits like astronauts, but we are wanting to make sure that everything is going to work out in life. Sometimes we, you know, we, we go into high school, college, we come out of college, get a postgraduate degree, and hoping that that will be enough to make it through the workforce. We get married and, and go through some material, books, movies, whatever, and having to prepare for new relationships, and sometimes it works out the way we want it to, sometimes it doesn't. And as we move throughout life, and change obviously happens, we want to make sure that we're prepared enough. But sometimes it feels that even if we know everything there is to know about a certain topic, that there's still something missing. Same thing with the astronauts, they still had to at some point after all the data was shared, after everything was memorized, after all the physical training was done, there was a matter of, of faith that needed to be implemented in order to be able to go on that ship. And so in life, in order to make it through life, we can know everything there is to know about life, but still there's a factor that comes into play that there is the unknown. There is the constant you know, X factor of things changing on a dime and going completely different direction that we didn't plan for it to go. And, and in those moments that we choose whether we want to put our faith in God or whether we want to continue to try things on our own. And so how are you dealing with the unknown today? As a man, how are you dealing with the unknown of navigating through life, wanting to become a better person, a better husband, a better father, a better son, a better follower of Jesus? How are you dealing with the unknown? Joshua had to deal with the unknown. Moses is gone and God's leading them into the promised land. He doesn't know what the, well, he kind of knows what the promised land looked like, but he doesn't know what he's going to face. He doesn't know what, what's going to be waiting for him. He doesn't know what complaints are going to be coming from the two million people that he's leading. He doesn't know if they're prepared or not. As a matter of fact, he doesn't know if he's prepared or not for what's going to happen, but he still begins to move in faith. And so in Joshua chapter 1, verse 10, uh, kind of continuing from last week, it says here, Joshua ordered the officers of the people and gave them this message. Go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. 
Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. In other words, to add some context to this meaning or some weight to these words, they had been waiting to get into the promised land, not just for 40 years, not for the 430 years that they were enslaved in Egypt, but they were waiting to go into the promised land since God had called Abraham to follow him. He says, I'm going to give you a great land and a great people. And so they had been wandering for years until finally God is saying, in three days time, you're going to enter this promise that I made long, long, long time ago. So you can kind of feel the anticipation that jo Joshua has, that the people has. We're finally going to be able to make it in. You, you know, our parents, our grandparents weren't able to, but we get to step in for them. And many of them were probably carrying their ancestors' bones with them because it meant so much to finally make it there and bury them in the land that God had been holding for them for such a long time. And so Abraham had been called and Moses kind of began the process and they're finally there. And so they have a choice to make. Whether they're going to believe that God is really giving them the land or if they have to step into the land and deal with a bunch of unknowns. They don't know. And I think many times we don't know. Like we maybe have read the Bible. Maybe we remember words that Jesus shared. Maybe we remember as a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, I believe in the Sabbath. I believe Jesus is coming back. But is he really coming back? I don't know how long you've been in the church, but you know, I'm not bragging about this, but three, two generations back are Adventists in my family, and we've kind of all been saying the same thing, that Jesus is coming back, and it's 2023, and stuff is still happening, stuff, worse stuff has been happening, and things have been constantly changing more than ever, and sometimes you are dealing with a tough situation, you ask yourself, are, are Jesus' words really true? But if they were true, if Jesus' words were true, what would you do? If the words in the Bible are really true, if Jesus' promises are true, if, if what God says about himself is true, what would look different in your life? How, how, how would you act if, if God's words were true? How would you navigate through your relationships if this was true? How would you deal with your finances, your home, your relationships, your life if God's words were true? You see, when we stop believing that God's words are true, then we kind of navigate through life kind of not thinking that there's any consequence to our actions. Like, we, we start guessing ourselves and saying, you know, is it, is it good to keep doing the right thing? And should I keep showing up when no one else shows up? And, and should I keep being patient when that person's not being patient towards me? And should I continue to forgive even when they haven't forgiven that one little thing I did to them years ago? And we start double guessing and, and, and second guessing every single thing we do what every single thing we think. But what if God's words were true? What would you do? And that's kind of where God's people are at. Three days time, we're going to enter the promised land. Is it true? And if it is true, how are we going to prepare to enter that land? So look, how, look at how God's people replied to Joshua. They answered Joshua and said this, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Like for you parents out there, wouldn't this be awesome? Your kids wake up one morning and say, dad, mom, whatever you command, I will do. Whatever you, whatever you send me, I will go. All right. If you have employees, if they said that to you, your spouse said that to you, like your church member said that to you. Oh, that's just me. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> pretty interesting, right? Humongous promise just made by God that they're going to enter the promised land and they go to Joshua and say, Joshua, we're ready. Like, whatever you want us to do, we're going to do it. And wherever you want us to go, we will go. We, we have no idea what's coming up ahead. We have no idea what people in Jericho look like. We have no idea what's waiting for us, but we're ready. We, we want to step into the land that God has for us. We don't know what, how, when, or, or how it's going to look like, but we want to step into it. What if God's people looked up to God every morning and said, God, whatever you have for me today, I'm going to do it. Wherever you want me to go today, I'm going to go. Like, what would it look like for the community of God to wake up tomorrow morning and have this mantra in our minds to say, God, whatever you want, 
wherever you want us to go. I believe that maybe our communities will look a little bit different. Maybe our city will feel a little bit different if this is what we chose to do. Jumping to Joshua chapter 3. After three days, the officers went through the camp. So the three days have passed. And they gave orders to the people and they said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and we're going to pause it for one second because this is very important. Up till this point from when they had left Egypt and they wandered for 40 years, God had been physically present. Okay? There was a pillar of fire during the day and there was a pillar, I'm sorry, there was a pillar of fire during the night, a pillar of cloud during the day. In other words, they could constantly see that God was present. Okay? There was, a, there was a physical reminder that God was with them, that God was for them. Also, when they messed up, there was a physical reminder that justice was right in front of them. But as they're about to enter the promised land, there's no more pillar of fire, there's no more cloud. From this point forward, the Ark of the Covenant, this Ark that has the two uh, cherubim kind of covering over it, the one that has the manna, the Ten Commandments inside, and Aaron's staff, this Ark, which is just an Ark, is just a physical Ark, nothing holy about it, but what makes it holy is that God's presence now is symbolized by this Ark that's moving with the people. And so Joshua's telling them, three days have passed, if you're truly ready, you're not going to move until the ark moves. In other words, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to go out and, and do your own homework. You don't need to kind of make your own plan. You don't need to get ahead of the ark. You just need to move with the ark. In other words, don't move until God moves. Right? Don't move until God moves. And so they tell them this from the get-go, that the ark is going to move and that the priests carrying it were going to move it. And said, you are to move out from your positions and follow the ark. We could stop and pause here for a long time about how we should wait on God. But I think one of the best things we can do as men is to not move on our own. Like sometimes we're impulsive and just want to act. Sometimes we have the urge to just prove that our manliness, that, that we're strong and that we got things figured out and we just act. Sometimes our pride steps in and we don't want to listen to anyone, including our spouse, our friends, our boss, or even God. But something we can take from this today and apply it today is that we should always move, but only move with God. Because when I move with God, then I'm allowing God to lead the way, and I don't need to figure everything out. I just need to trust that he has my front, my back, and he's walking alongside me. So how different would my relationship with my spouse be if I said, you know what, we're not going to make a decision on this until God moves. You know what, we're not going to try to figure this all out until, until God explains it to us. You know what, we're not going to get into something and fight about something that is not salvific. In other words that's not determining our eternal life until God shows us a way through it. I think our relationships, our position, our identity would be a lot more secure if we moved only when God moved. I believe God is constantly moving but sometimes we want to move without him. Sometimes we want to drag him along the way. Sometimes we want to prove that he's wrong and that we are right. The instruction was to wait until the ark moved, because if the ark moved, God was moving. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth, set foot in the Jordan, when the priests set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now, it's interesting that God is telling them what's going to happen before it happens. And I think this is important. Because if God wouldn't have told them what was going to happen before it happened, they wouldn't have believed it. In other words, they wouldn't have believed that God was doing it. They would have found some logical explanation or some scientific explanation to explain what was happening. 
And so it's amazing that God is telling them what's going to happen before it happens. And, 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 and what's interesting about this is that there's a contrast between this crossing of the Jordan and the crossing of the Red Sea when Moses, Moses led the people. When Moses led the people the first time, Moses kind of lift, lifted up his staff, he prayed to God, and God parted the waters before they even stepped into the waters. This time around, God is saying the priest with the Ark of the Covenant are going to step into the waters and the waters are going to stop and you're going to be able to cross the Jordan River. Now, what's important about this is the following. God almost never works the same way twice. Almost never. And sometimes we wish he worked the same way over and over again because we kind of want to own what God does. We kind of want to take ownership of it. We kind of want to take some credit for it and say, okay, if God worked this way in my life, then most surely he's going to work again. And probably the worst thing we do is that we tell other people how God's going to work in our life because he, we believe that he's going to work the same way in their life that he has worked in our life. We have no idea how God's going to work in their life or how he's going to work in our life again because that's not the point. The point is not about learning the method. The point is in following the master of the method. You see, God wanted his people to trust him, not the method. God wanted, him, God wanted them to trust not Moses, not the staff, but to trust him. And so now you have a new leader in place. They have a body of water to cross. And God says, I'm not going to repeat the same story again. But in a different way, I'm going to show you that I have power over all things. What if God was wanting to work in your life in a new way? What if God was wanting to work in your life in a different way? But we were so stuck on the method that he used in the past that we're failing to see the new miracle that he's trying to work out in our lives. What if God wanted to be, help you become a different man in your relationships? Not the man you were last year, but the man he needs you to be today. What if God wanted you to behave differently in your marriage? Not the same way you acted um, when you first got married, but in a new way in 2023. Or what if God needs you to be a different type of father today than you were 10, 15 years ago when your kids came into this world? What if what God is wanting to do is something new and better and upgraded and so much more beautiful than the way he did in the past, but we're so stuck in the past that we're not allowing him to move? It's not about the method, it's about the master. And when we're so concerned in the method, we miss the new way that God is moving today. God had a new way that he wanted to work and he told them ahead of time. And he says, this is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive, you, drive out before you, that he will certainly go ahead of you. There's a new action that required a new faith. A new faith. And God wants to work in new ways in your life, not just to create new faith, but to deepen your faith. And so yesterday's faith is not going to be good enough for today's action. Your parents' faith is not going to be good enough for your life. Your friend's faith is not going to be good enough. That grandma that you know that always prays, her faith is not good enough for you because you need to develop your own faith. One of the things that spoke the most about my father growing up is that many times I would wake up early to go to school, just a few times, because I would usually wake up late, but the few times that I woke up early, I would wake up and go into um, the kitchen. Before I made it to the kitchen in that house, I needed to walk through the living room, and I would see my dad on his knees praying. And I would pause there and look at my dad praying, and, and so many things would go through my mind. The first one is like, man, my dad's praying. I wonder what he's praying for. And, and then, you know, shortly after that, he's like, he's probably praying for me that I don't mess up in school again. And so I was like, man, I really got to be on my best behavior today because dad's praying. Um, the second thing that usually come to my mind is like, man, my dad has a relationship with God. And I looked at my dad completely different when I, know, when I knew that he was praying that day because I knew that if he was with God, I couldn't mess with him that day. I also knew that the words coming out of his mouth were going to be different because he had been praying that day. I also knew that his, his intentions that day, even though I might you know, misunderstand them, they were probably coming from a good place because he had been with God that day. And so one of the things that spoke so powerfully in my life about my dad being dad and being my, my father was that he was on his knees praying to his father. And his faith 
was good for him. And so now as I'm a father, I can't depend on his prayer time, even though he still continues to pray for me and my kids. I have to pray for me, my wife, and my kids every single day because although he's praying, I also need to be connected to the one that wants to lead my life. Yesterday's prayer is not going to be good enough for today's trials. Someone else's faith is not going to be good enough for what I'm facing, the challenges I'm going through in life. And so what God was trying to tell Joshua and say, hey, you had a great leader before you. Moses was a man of God. He went up to the mountain. We spoke face to face. But his experience with me is not your experience with me. If you want to succeed in life and to have a good life and a life full of wisdom and love and joy, then we have to allow our faith to be developed in God. If you want your marriage to improve and your communication with your wife to improve, you first have to improve your communication with your heavenly father for him to give you the right words and clarity and directions and motives in your life. If you want to become a better father and a better father than your father was to you, then you have to connect to the ultimate father in heaven who's going to show you this unconditional love, acceptance, grace, and forgiveness so that you can extend that to your kids over and over and over again. You see... Joshua didn't give the people the entire plan, but he gave them enough of the plan for them to exercise their faith. And many times God does with that, that, the same thing with us. He's not going to give you the whole plan until you begin to trust part one of the plan. And until I don't exercise part one of the plan, I'm not going to get part two of the plan. We need to kind of give up that desire to have the whole plan and allow our faith to be worked out. The story continues and says that when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of the people. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, flood stage all during the harvest. And I, and I pause that part right there just to make a point that the author's making. Not only is the Jordan kind of impossible to cross for two million people on its, on its normal stage, it's during flood stage. In other words, the water's probably up 30 or 30, 45% of the water. That means that if it was deep before, now it's deeper. If they tried to cross the Jordan on their own right now, they would need a lot of rafts to kind of cross over and come back and forth, and it would have taken weeks. So the story says, and it kind of highlights that fact as it goes into it and says, yet as soon as the priests who carry the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, listen to what happened, the water from upstream what? Stopped. It stopped. So if we pause right there, when do you know, uh, when do we kind of guess that they found out it stopped? I recently heard a sermon that said that the water stopped for them right there. I I kind of reread it, correct me if I'm wrong. It stopped upstream. And the town where it stopped was called Adam, which is about 30 miles away. This is interesting because nowhere in the Bible, again, do we find this city. We do find that one in the New Testament. About 30 miles up. So if water is flowing down a river about 30 miles up, I kind of guessed it would probably have taken two to three hours for that stop to finally make it to where they were at. In other words, the priest stepped into the water, and for where they were at, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I imagine for those couple of minutes or hours that maybe passed, a lot of them started second guessing and saying, hey, we, we, we got ready. Like, like I've been exercising and dieting for three days. Like I packed the bare essentials here. Like uh, we, can't, we can't stay here for too long, right? I got things to do. I got people to see. I got places to visit. If we're not making it into the promised land, then let me know. I'll make some other plans. For a couple of hours, nothing's happening, but the priests are still standing in the water. For a couple of hours, the priests are holding up that heavy ark, believing that something's going to happen, even though nothing has happened for them. And many times, life looks this way. 
We pray and ask God to do something in our lives. We do an act of faith or an act of obedience, and we kind of step into the waters, and nothing's happening. We look up, we look around, and say, God, do I need to take a picture of this? Do I need to document it to prove that I stepped into the waters and that you didn't move? But just because we don't see God moving, just because we don't see what God is doing, just because we can't see the whole plan, it does not mean that God is not on the move. You see, 30 miles upstream, God was working. 30 miles upstream, God had cut off the water, even though the stream or the river was flooded. Even though they couldn't see the effects of the miracle, it was about a couple of hours away from that miracle hitting them. Maybe, just maybe, sometimes we miss out on the miracle. Sometimes we miss out on an opportunity. Sometimes our faith does not go deeper because we're not willing to stay in the water until the water cuts off. Sometimes we're more concerned about how we look. Sometimes we're more concerned about what people will say. Sometimes we're more concerned about that not being our plan and that our plan was better. Maybe, just maybe, God is inviting us just to stand in the water. Just to stand there and to wait for him to move. Where is God having you stand today? Maybe he's led you up to the edge of the Jordan and he's just waiting for you to step into the water and you're kind of doubting, questioning. You're kind of trying to figure it all out if God is trustworthy, if his words are true, if he's going to come through for you. You're maybe double-guessing yourself and saying, man, I, I did that one thing last week or I said that thing. Uh, maybe I haven't been good enough man or father or son or, or friend. You know, maybe because of all of those things, when you add them all the bad things up, it's just too much bad stuff. Maybe God can't work with all that bad stuff. I don't know what's causing you to pause at the edge of the Jordan, but that's maybe where you are today. Or maybe you were at the edge of the Jordan, now you have stepped in and you're waiting for those waters to stop. You're waiting for that miracle to kind of hit home. You're waiting for that prayer to be answered and you're just waiting. Or maybe you were in the water and you stepped out because you got impatient or you doubted or you got anxious or you got scared. And you're wanting to believe that God's going to cut off the water, but he hasn't done it just yet. Story says that the water had stopped even though they couldn't feel the stop yet, but they stayed in the water. And we don't know how long they stayed there, but they stayed there until it was completely cut off. And so the people crossed over to the opposite side and to Jericho. Just because we can't see God moving doesn't mean he's not on the move. Just because we don't have the full plan doesn't mean that the first part of the plan won't work. Just because we don't feel comfortable where God has us or where he wants us to go does not mean that he has a promised land on the other side that he's preparing for us. Sometimes we need to stay in the water. Sometimes we just need to stay there and stay there and stay there until we see God moving. Sometimes God wants us to stay there so that our faith will be ready for what God has next for us. You see, the reason I believe that God had them stay in the water was that God knew what was ahead. You see, God knew that there was a fortified city called Jericho, a city where two chariots could go side by side on top of those walls, a, a city that was impenetrable, that with the technology and, 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 and weapons that Israel had, it was going to be impossible to take over Jericho. So they needed to learn something important. They needed to learn and to be reminded and for their faith to be deepened, not when they got to Jericho, but in the water. You see, God knows what's coming ahead in your life. He knows the challenges and the obstacles. He knows the opportunities. He knows the trials. He knows the pain, the suffering, the loss that you were experiencing. And maybe he's wanting you to wait in the water for you to trust him in a new way. Maybe he's wanting you to stay in the water so that your feet and your legs will strengthen. Maybe he's having you stay in the water because maybe being in the water is better than rushing off ahead until the next day. Unless we trust God in the Jordan, we won't be able to trust them at Jericho. So wherever God has you today, whether you're on the edge of the Jordan or in the waters, 
God is moving. And he's wanting you to move with him. The story says that the priest jumped into the water and stayed in the water. And when they stayed not only in the water, but they stayed in the middle of the Jordan. And they stood there on dry ground while all of Israel passed until the whole nation had completed the crossing of dry ground. I wish I would have been there just to see their faces before the Jordan and then after the Jordan. <laughs> to have seen their faces when the ark went into the water and nothing happened. But then a couple of minutes later, a couple of hours later, they saw the water levels decreasing until it was completely dry and they crushed over. And I imagine if you were to ask them and if we were to interview all of them and say, hey, how did you feel about God here? And how did you feel about God here and God over here? I'm sure their faith levels would have been very different at very different stages. But what if we were to ask them, can God be trusted? In other words, can I trust him? Can you trust him? Can you trust him today with finding your purpose and your meaning in life? Can you trust him today with that problem that you're experiencing alone or with your family or with a group of people? Can you trust him with your position of where you are today as a, as a man or as a person in this world in 2023? You might be saying, well, Reuben, I'm, I'm having a hard time believing because I'm doubting. And I want to reassure you today that every single person doubts. <laughs> every single person doubts. Every one of those people in the Bible that we all kind of put up there on a pedestal, they doubted. They questioned. They had a hard time believing in different seasons of life if God really was going to come through. The question is not whether we're going to doubt or not. The question is we're going to trust God even with our doubts. I believe today that God is on the move. And he's, got, he's on the move in, in your life. I think he's got you and he's got your life in his hands. And so the one thing and maybe the only thing we should do today is to praise him. Whether we're on the Jordan's edge, whether we're in the water, whether we're already on dry ground, we should give him praise. Whether we don't know what's going to happen or we do know what's going to happen, whether we have one part of the plan or the entire plan, I think the only thing we can do and the only thing that God wants for us or from us is our hearts, is our praise. So it's not whether we're going to have struggles or not or problems or not, it's how we're going to get through them. I think the best way to get through struggles and trials and tribulations to, through pain and loneliness and loss is to just give praise to the master that can work all things out for our good. Today you can give him all you have. Today you can give him praise. Going back to that NASA experience or story, during different Journeys up to space in different moments. Like I said earlier, they experienced different moments where they lost communication. Where they kind of would send a message from the shuttle and, and nothing would come back. Sometimes it was just basic information to let them know where they were in their orbit or their travel. Other moments it was because they really needed help. <laughs> Like they had hit a glitch or they were going the wrong direction or something had broken and, and they would communicate it back home and, and nothing would come back. And so multiple astronauts have said that during those moments that they would hear nothing back, they had to trust the plan. They had to trust their training. They had to trust that everything they had learned and everything they had practiced was enough to carry them over and through those moments of no communication. Maybe today you're like that astronaut who's trying to signal back to heaven and you're asking for help, you're asking for directions, you're asking for clarity. Maybe you're just asking for God to be near in a new way. I believe that when you don't hear anything back, you just got to trust the plan. You got to trust that God is moving. You got to trust that God is working it out. You got to trust that God is better than NASA technology, that even when you don't hear nothing back, it doesn't mean that God's not listening. It just means that he's working in a different way. So wherever you are today in your journey, as a man or as an individual, you got to trust God with your life. You got to trust God with your family. You got to trust that he's not only going to sustain you in the Jordan, but he's going to help you cross over. As we sing the next song this morning to praise God, I, I pray and encourage you and invite you to open up your heart, lift up your hands, 
and just give him all the praise and glory this morning for who he is.